So I just finished reading A Thousand Sons by Graham McNeil. It's the 12th installment of the Horse Heresy series, and it follows uh, the story of Magnus the Red and his legion of space marines, which are called the Thousand Sons, hence the name of the book. And overall, I thought this book was great. I had previously read Ahriman's Omnibus, which has three books that follows one of Magnus's primary captains named Ahriman. But this book takes place long after the story that happens in A Thousand Sons. So as I was reading A Thousand Sons, it was filling in lots of different gaps in the lore that I didn't quite know uh, at the time of reading this other trilogy. And I'm just starting to realize that there's so many details to cover when it comes to this Legion. So one reason I think this book is so great is it's essentially a story of a son, Magnus, trying to prove himself to his father, the emperor, and all the links that he will go through to do that. But what he he kind of screws himself because as he tries harder and harder, he's really just pushing his father farther and farther away from him. And there's one point later in the book where he does what he thinks is a very important deed in order to warn his father about something. But essentially, he just burns the bridge with his father entirely. And as you're reading this particular scene, if you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about. As you're reading this particular scene, you just know that Magnus is realizing that he'll never have a relationship with his father ever again. Or if he does, it's not going to be for tens of thousands of years, possibly. Yes, the timelines in Warhammer 40k are fucking ridiculous. But I think that's one way you can connect this story. It's hard in Warhammer. It can be hard to connect in a human way to some of these uh, superhuman characters. But I think Graham McNeil does a really good job of humanizing Magnus for the reader. I think all of us have at one time or another tried to prove ourselves to our parents. And that's essentially what's going on here. There were a couple of scenes that really stick out in my mind. One in particular was the scene on Agoru at the beginning of the book where uh, Magnus and the captains of the Thousand Sons, they come across these titans, uh, these giant statues in the valley of Agoru. Graham McNeil is writing the description of these statues. And as he's writing the description, I'm going, it sounds like they're Eldar. They are supposedly inert and they haven't moved for thousands of years. But the whole time I'm thinking, they've got to be Eldar. They've got to be Eldar. There's no way they're not Eldar. And I don't know exactly if this is the first showing of Eldar technology in the Horus Heresy. I haven't read um, all of the Horus Heresy books up until this point. But based on everything else I've read, I was like, this has got to be it. And so it was really satisfying when farther into the book, they finally wake up and it turns out, oh, what do you know? They are definitely Elder Titans. But I think at the time, the Thousand Sons and Magnus don't even know what the Eldar are yet because they're never, they never actually name these Titans as Eldar, but the way that they fight, the way that they move, the way their, their armor is described, everything just screams Eldar. It's also the fact that they're obviously uh, defending a webway portal underneath the mountain. So I thought all of that, having a, having a little bit more knowledge than the Thousand Sons did, made that scene a little bit more cool for me. And it's also just a badass action sequence. I think another thing to note about this book is that it's important to read it alongside Prospero Burns by Dan Abnett, which is, I believe, book 11 in the Horus Heresy series. I've been kind of jumping around the Horus Heresy reading, um, reading the books out of order because there's just so goddamn many of them. I commend anybody who goes through and reads all of them back to back to back, but I think it's a smarter idea to pick and choose which ones you read because not all of them are at the same level of writing as the others. But these two books, A Thousand Sons and Prospero Burns, are definitely meant to be read together because they cover the same exact events just from different perspectives. Um, so there's little things like there's this Council of Nikia that happens, which is not a little thing. It's actually a massive event in the, the Warhammer universe. When I read Prospero Burns first, we see that from the Space Wolves perspective, and it's a much different view of the council. You don't get a lot of details about what happens at the time. You just know that it's kind of this trial for Magnus. But then when you read A Thousand Sons, you realize, oh my God, there's all of this extra information about things that are going on. But at the same time, there's also, there's things that happen from the Space Wolves perspective that the Thousand Sons never pick up on, or it's not revealed in this particular book. So I think it's important to read both of these um, back to back in order to get the full picture around these events. And then obviously, I don't think this is too much of a spoiler if you've read Warhammer or know anything about the Horus Heresy. 
you know that Prospero is the home world of the Thousand Suns and it gets destroyed and annihilated essentially by the Space Wolves. And that's covered from both angles in both of these books. In Prospero Burns, uh, you get a very brief analysis of that battle. It comes in very late into the book, which I think is a little weird. Like the title of the book is Prospero Burns. But I think it's only the last like 60 pages or something that really cover Prospero being annihilated. The rest of the book is more of a story about one of their remembrancers and how he becomes a part of the clan that is the Space Wolves. And I, I mean, the story is fantastic. It just feels like the title is slightly off. But in A Thousand Suns, you get about, I think you get about 150 pages that covers the battle of Prospero. So it was almost like I got a little teaser and Prospero burns and then a thousand suns just brings it home with all of the information that you kind of probably wanted in the 11th book. There's one particular relationship that I wanted to highlight from the book and that's the relationship between Avermon and this space wolf librarian Othmir Wordmake. Don't quote me on that pronoun uh, pronunciation but I'm pretty sure that's that's close. Essentially, Ahriman, he's one of the main captains for the Thousand Sons and also one of the main characters in the book. And at some point on Agoru, he's saved by uh, this space wolf librarian during one of his uh, meditation explorations of the warp. This space wolf librarian saves him from some sort of unknown demon. And through that, they bond and start to share different secrets about their uh, different legions back and forth and how they both use the warp. And I thought, at first, I thought that was a cool bond. I thought I thought it was going in a different direction. I thought, oh, you're going to have a space wolf who doesn't want Prospero to burn at the end of this. This guy's going to see all the benefits uh, of what the Thousand Sons are doing, and maybe he'll even advocate for the Thousand Sons at some point in time. At the Council of Nakia, you realize that this guy is just a backstabbing, two-timing liar, essentially, and he was just lying to Ahriman the whole time, and I've found... Personally, I didn't see that coming, and it was slightly heartbreaking for me to see Avermont's trust get destroyed. Um, and I think at some point in the beginning of the book, you genuinely believe that these are good characters and they care about uh, the Imperium and they're trying to do the best thing for the Emperor. And they might know that what they're doing could be considered heresy by some of the other legions, but they think, hey, eventually everybody's going to come around to what we're doing once they see the fruits of our labors, essentially. Once people see the benefits that we can bring to the world through our mastery of the warp, they'll be singing a different tune about what we're doing. Othmir's betrayal of Ahriman is just a small metaphor for the rest of the story and how the rest of, essentially the Thousand Sons are being shunned and isolated from the rest of the Empire and from the Emperor. It's almost like the Emperor is responsible for turning the Thousand Sons into what they become later on. In some ways, if the Space Wolves or Othmir had tried to maybe work with the Thousand Sons, maybe it wouldn't have gone the direction it ends up going. So there's just little moments throughout the book like that where you're seeing foreshadowing uh, of what's to come. And you're also seeing, like, the, this is the origin story for the Thousand Sons. They go from being these uh, people who love the Emperor to the complete opposite. One of the other main storylines of the book follows the Remembrancers. Uh, there's three of them. There's Lemuel, Camille, and Callista. These are essentially the artists, archaeologists, journalists that are covering uh, the expedition of the Thousand Sons. And if you haven't read 40k before, these type of characters, they're sent out with the legions of the Crusade in order to record the deeds that are done by the Space Marines and send them back to Terra to be recorded in the annals of history, essentially. They do a number of different things, whether it's writing books or literature about these deeds or creating works of art, taking photos, paintings, etc. But there's these three characters have a pretty large role in this book. We spent a good deal of time following their uh, points of view. And I think that was one of the only downsides I had to this book. You know, I liked Lemuel as a character. I thought his point of view was a worthwhile part of the story. He does a really good job of humanizing Ahriman, especially. And Ahriman is a large character in 40k lore. Not especially in this book, he's very important. But I know moving forward in the storyline, um, he's only going to get more and more important. So I think in this book, it was really important to humanize him a little bit and to get a look into how he thinks and how he feels and how empathetic he really is 
and we're able to do that through this remembrancer Lemuel. But the other two remembrancers, Camille and Callista, they were important to the story, but I just didn't feel like their points of view provided that much more information. But there's certain things that happen with them that move the plot along, so you just kind of had to read from their point of view at certain points. Let's see how many times I can say points in this review. But yeah, overall, this book is good. It's very well written. It's not the most spectacular thing I've ever read in my entire life, but I would definitely recommend it to any Warhammer 40k fan. It's got a lot of essential lore tucked away in here. At times in the middle, it gets a little slow, but the last 150 pages were riveting and I just flew through them. I gave the book a 7 out of 10 overall, so pretty solid score. And yeah, I'm looking forward to reading my next Horus Heresy book. If you like this review, uh, drop me a like down below, maybe a subscription, and I will see you in the next review.